How long have you been 17? I am a vampire. And you are mortal. <laughs> Hello and welcome to This Podcast Sucks, the show where we take a bite out of the vampire genre. We'll be following all manner of fanged fiends through the past 127 years of film and television. From Nosferatu to Twilight, I'm your host, Tara. And I'm your host, Elliot. So today, Elliot, we will be talking about the famous 1931 Dracula directed by Todd Browning. And technically, Carl Freund as well, although he's not credited, but we will get into that in a little bit. The film is based off of a screenplay by Garrett Fort, who based the screenplay off the 1924 play of the same name by Hamilton Dean and John L. Balderston. The cast includes Bela Lugosi as Count Dracula, Helen Chandler as Mina Seward, David Manners as John Harker, Dwight Fry as Renfield, and Edward Van Sloan as Van Helsing. So, should I talk a little bit about the production of this, Elliot? Yes, that would be great. <laughs> I I will admit, I thought that Lugosi was the director <laughs> for, for, uh, for many, many years. Because people called it Bella Lugosi's Dracula. So I was like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, mm-hmm. it's yes. Lugosi, the director. Um, oh, yeah. Always interesting to see what films are credited as a director's movie, like Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, or an actor's movie, kind mm-hmm. of. Um, but yes, no, he did not <laughs> direct Dracula. <laughs> the film was produced by Carl Lemley Jr., who was the son of Universal Studios founder Carl Lemley, and he was 23 when he produced Dracula. So... Wow. Nothing nothing a little nepotism can't get you. <laughs> uh, the original Nepo so, baby? No. There have to um, there mm. there have to have been Nepo babies long before. Oh oh my gosh, it's Hollywood. I think that was always gonna be the case since its founding, but you know, now it's like branding deals for social media, not getting to produce an entire feature film out of college so (laughs) um so the lead role of dracula was originally intended for kind of a few different actors and the road to getting uh the now iconic bela lugosi um was a bit uh tricky so uh the role was originally intended for conrad veit who uh for our listeners who do not know was a a german english actor from the silent film era known for such works as the cabinet of dr caligari however veit uh feared his english was not good enough to portray the role and another actor that was rumored to have been considered for the project, although I don't think this was ever officially confirmed, was the great uh, silent film actor Lon Chaney, who our listeners might know from such works as The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Fan with the Opera. And he was kind of known as the Man of a Thousand Faces because he was just a master at physical transformation for his roles and makeup and designing his own characters. And he went to very extreme lengths when portraying uh, a variety of roles, many of which were uh, kind of outcast characters in these early silent horror films. So naturally he seemed like a pretty good fit. However, unfortunately he did die from throat cancer in 1930, so. Interesting, because I saw that he died of a pneumonia related hemorrhage. Well. Okay, yes, that's oh, or my did bad. He, he did, did, he he did die of pneumonia? that. You are right, but he, I think beforehand he had been diagnosed with throat cancer a few years before. Okay. So maybe that uh, precipitated uh, his illness. So, yeah, so unfortunately he passed. And then it was kind of just, you know, the classic everyone in Hollywood who who could play this part uh, they <laughs> they went through a lot of um, American actors uh, at the time kind of considering different ones to play uh, I think uh, yeah like I don't remember many of the names I know Paul Muni was one of them uh, but the um, Hungarian born Lugosi portrayed Dracula in the 1924 
play that mm-hmm. this film is more based off of than the original novel. And he, he really fought for the role. Um, but, you know, as is the case with all, you know, all film productions, if it's un- unknown in the lead role, producers are a little hesitant uh, a little just wary. because it's more of a gamble. Mm-hmm. Um, but he did eventually went out on the part, and I believe he accepted in a very low fee uh, for it. I think he was getting maybe like five hundred dollars a week. Um, That's what I saw as well. That he was yeah. he was basically um, he was <laughs> as close to working for free for the time as yes. as he could have been. Yes. So for for what is now one of the most iconic performances in horror film history yes he accepted an incredibly low salary for it so production by all accounts was pretty disorganized the director of the film todd browning uh was not not the a biggest bit of a, kind of this, a bit of an well, absentee of, father a bit case. of an absentee and he also just didn't like the script um so it, it was kind of a, a i don't know maybe a i'll take the money kind of directing job but by all counts yes he was absentee he was not a fan of the script and could be seen tearing out pages from the script which could explain why the movie is so short it's a really short movie um so, the cinematographer, Carl Freund, is now considered to have been a um, uncredited co-director of this film. Mm-hmm. And he took over a lot of the shooting when Todd Browning was absent. So, you know, good yes. to know. It's like, it's, that's as far back as film goes. It's not just, don't worry, darling. <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> yeah. I forget, who's the cinematographer for Don't Worry, Darling? Because... He's also a very famous cinematographer. And... I can't, I can't remember, but I, I think I one like I, I remember reading that um, he didn't really have shot lists, or they would kind of show up to set, and there wasn't really a plan for what they do for that for day. Don't worry, darling. Um, oh, for um, for uh, for Dracula. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't worry, darling. I know less about. I have heard that Olivia Wilde was um, perhaps otherwise occupied. And yes, that Florence I, Pugh would yes, step in for her a yes, lot, but you yeah, know, who, so who knows? Happens. Yeah, true. Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, a very, a very disorganized production, mm-hmm. as you said, and uh, many of the cast members too kind of hated their roles and yes. thought the movie was <laughs> overwrought and silly. Which mm, they're not entirely wrong there. <laughs> no one seemed sorry, to enjoy sorry. it. Yeah. No one seemed to enjoy it except Bela. We'll get to that. Um, but the, yes, these people included uh, Edward Van Sloan and Helen Chandler. Uh, in the case of Edward Van Sloan, who plays Van Helsing, he just thought uh, who he actually played the role in the play as well. But I think he wrote in a letter to his son that he said something like, oh, I'm so sorry you had to see this. It's overwrought or, you know, it's overacted, overwritten. It's, you know, it's bad. And he didn't like it. <laughs> In the well, case of Hel- uh, some, someone oh, said something like "truly lousy," or <laughs> yeah, true. Just... I think he said that. You're just like it's lousy, and <laughs> um, again, you know, are these are they entirely wrong? Hmm. Well, uh, we'll get into that. But uh, Helen Chandler, um, understandably, you know, was a leading playing a leading female role in a horror film where she was essentially playing the quintessential damsel in distress so her frustration Mm -hmm. understandable for different reasons um but yes so everyone here not having the best time or at the very least were involved in a disorganized affair of a film production Mm -hmm. so you know, those those happen. Those are certainly the case when making a movie. But Bela Lugosi took his role very seriously, as you could imagine, from how much he fought for the part and how little of a salary mm-hmm. he was um, he took. And so he kind of distanced himself from the cast. He went a little method with it. I just, yeah, something about this role makes actors want to go method. <laughs> uh, but in this case, uh, I, you know, it, it, it sounds a little more... Um, not silly necessarily, but just uh, kind of, well, here's how he would distance himself. He would kind of in psyching himself up before 
takes. He would kind of walk across the set and he would flip his cape or he would pose in front of a mirror and proclaim, I am Dracula on set. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, like compared to other ways method actors have gotten into character, it's like it's one of the more innocent ones. <laughs> yeah, fake it till you make it, you know? <laughs> You know, whatever you got to do, it's just, yeah, if it neither harms nor <laughs> yeah. hinders other members on set. So, yes, that's kind of how he would psych himself up. And I love that Helen Chandler who played Mina would just straight up laugh when he did that. Like she was. She did was, you just... did you see that she was drunk? Because one place that I looked at said that she was drunk for a significant portion of um, the shoot and that that could have contributed yeah. to some of her uh, attitude. Well. Yeah, so I I didn't read anything about her being intoxicated or drinking on set, but I did know that she was struggling with uh, alcoholism at the time. Okay. So, which is unfortunate. And um, yeah, I don't know. I honestly don't know much about uh, her career post-Dracula. I think Mm -hmm. she also, like a lot of actors in this film, she struggled with being typecast. But um, Uh yes, so she she was uh, struggling with that while shooting the film. So speaking of typecasting, Lugosi did not want to be typecast, and he refused to reprise the role in a later touring production of the play. And he purportedly said when he was offered the part, he said, no, not at any price. When I'm through with this picture, I hope to never hear of Dracula again. I cannot stand it. I do not intend that it shall possess me. So that would kind of become tragically ironic as Lugosi would become mm-hmm. typecast and known for this role. And he would be cast as vampires in other movies, although he would only reprise the role one more time in Abbott and, Con- and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. Um well, so I think. Yeah, and for, no, oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think another interesting aspect of the method acting and the typecasting concerns, and, you know, the fact that he was so worried. I think even while they were shooting, he was worried about being typecast. Um, but one of a kind of more famous quote associated with this production um, is from David Manners, the man who played John Harker. And he said of Lugosi, I never thought he was acting, but being the odd man he was. Mm. Um, Mm. So it's interesting that he was so worried about being typecast, um, but it seems that at least one person on the production, but I think considering his reputation for being kind of weird, Um, it seemed that some people thought that he wasn't necessarily doing a ton of acting and was just kind of being um, his kind of strange self. Um, So I just, I thought that that was, that was an interesting kind of, um, you know, contradiction there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is interesting. And uh, yeah, Bill Lugosi is um, an interesting figure sort of in terms of how this rule did kind of overtake his life and um, how he struggled with that. Um, He also struggled with um, pretty bad morphine and alcohol addiction as well um, and struggled, I think, to kind of break out of this um, typecasting. So unfortunately, it did become true, um, his fears that he would be typecast. But um, yeah, no, going back to what you're saying about um, him being considered kind of strange, I think the only time he ever spoke with the crew apparently or the cast is he would just say good morning when he came to set and good night when he left so <laughs> yeah just you know that makes me think of uh, the meme from Abbott Elementary that people use it's uh, where one of the characters uh, she says uh, she's a teacher and she says I do my work I go home <laughs> and yes yeah a real of, a real team player <laughs> real team players so it kind of sounds like he, he was he was doing that a bit typecasting kind of abounded a bit for the actors in this movie. Um, I would say next to Bela Lugosi, uh, Dwight Fry, who plays Renfield, also kind of got the most... I, I don't know. Can you... Typecasting? Why isn't typecasting a verb? I don't know. <laughs> like, they caught the typecasting. Um, <laughs> the, the virus, the curse. The, the curse of type uh, typecasting. Uh, Dwight Fry would often be cast... Uh, in subsequent film roles as these also uh, kind of manic 
or mentally disturbed characters as well. The manic um, pixie well, dream boy. <laughs> the manic pixie dream boy. Listen, we'll get into this, but Dwight Fry is what surprised me the most about this movie, the Renfield character. Um, so yeah. And for our listeners who do not know, a Spanish language version was also shot concurrently uh, with this film on the same sets in Universal. And while it initially did not receive much attention when it was released, it was discovered later on and is now considered by some to be the superior film in terms of technicality and explicitness. So Yes, this was the biggest plot twist of <laughs> doing the research for this episode. <laughs> and just to clarify for the viewer, when we mean co-currently and using the same sets, like... Bella Lugosi, like his version of Dracula would shoot during the day. Everyone would leave and an entirely new cast and crew would arrive that night to shoot essentially the same content again because the director of the Spanish language version would watch the dailies, which is the mm -hmm. footage that was mm -hmm. shot that day. George Malford right. um, would watch the footage that had been shot and then would base the footage that he shot that night on those dailies. Um, mm -hmm. And they used, they worked off of the same script. Um, so I found this to be one of the most fascinating parts of this oh, film yeah. and its backstory. Um, and I think the other thing that's really interesting about this, I don't know if you were going to get into this, but this was actually like um, fairly common Mm -hmm. for for the time or at least for universal because at this phase um universal was trying to expand its viewership and get foreign audiences and they did that mostly through spanish language versions of their films mm -hmm. yes yeah, mm -hmm. so i thought that that was totally totally fascinating yes no it is totally fascinating and um, unfortunately kind of a short-lived trend i think after the uh the uh, not subpar but the i guess underwhelming success uh, or not a success but the underwhelming results of the spanish language release i think they kind of stopped it after that mm -hmm. um but yeah no it's it's really fascinating and i'm excited for when we watch it and can compare to the 1931 version i also read that the spanish language version is i think it's at least 20 minutes longer yeah probably because the director wasn't ripping out pages from the script, so. <laughs> and it, from what I've read, they seemed a little more, we'll get into this, but we, it seemed a little more invested in action and things actually happening. Oh, um, gosh, yeah. So, than, hmm. than some of the hey, events of everyone, Dracula. Yeah. Could you tell this was based on a play? <laughs> so... <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the film was uh, released and premiered at the Roxy Theater in New York City on February 12th, 1931. And then it was released two days later throughout the U.S. And uh, newspapers reported that members of the audience fainted in shock at the horror on screen. But who knows if that is just kind of false advertising to get people to come see the movie. Who knows? So some fun facts from the movie. Dracula's line, I never drink wine, was original to the film and it is not in the play or the book, which surprised me because it's been a while since I read the book, so I couldn't remember if that line was in the original text or not, but it is a pretty iconic line now, so mm -hmm. that's cool. Um, also, the studio did not want the scene where Dracula attacks Renfield to be filmed due to the perceived gay subtext of the situation. And a memo was sent to the director stating, and I quote, Dracula is only to attack women. So <laughs> oh my God. there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so much. I will say that they failed and there is still uh, gay cause subtext. Um, <laughs> listen... Yes, that that was a that was a hard fail. Like if you thought there was some some subtext in the Nosferatu film, oh boy, uh, yes. <laughs> we're gonna get into it in the Legosi one. But yes, pretty, you know, it's sadly a reflection of the time, and also disturbing how you would conflate the violence and the sexuality of mm -hmm. something like that, only to be okay if it's a male vampire doing it to a 
woman. So. Yes, it's very it's very Argento to you know his yeah. famous quote of like if I'm going to watch a woman die, it it is better for it to be a beautiful woman. Uh, that's a paraphrasing, but um, it wow. it definitely yes, it was uh, it was uh, and he I think he said this at a press conference, and he he was like. I certainly don't have to explain or justify myself when I say this. And it was, it's like a pretty, um, but I mean, the thing was that he, he was just saying something that I think the horror genre had been bearing out for decades. I mean, as you're saying, mm -hmm. like we, the like studio is literally giving this note that like this eroticized violence can only be done upon women. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like as we were talking about, even with um, the House of the Devil, they parade this beautiful woman on and off stage. And in Nosferatu, um, Mina's kind of youth and beauty and purity is also very much um, mm -hmm. an aspect of the film and of her character. So, um, mm -hmm. but that's a yeah. that's a great quote. I did not come across that in my research. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, definitely. Um... And last fun fact, five posters were designed by Universal Advertising Art Director Carly Gross. Um, with the Style A poster, that is the one uh, with kind of the disembodied head of Bela Lugosi uh, looking menacing with the blue background and the text mm -hmm. Dracula. It's called the Style A poster, and it's sold for over $500,000, making it the most expensive film poster in the world. Wow. When did it sell for that much? When? Um, yeah. I think it was pretty recently. I want to say a few years ago, but there's mm -hmm. also only two original prints of it left. Wow. Okay. Um, I, I think Nick Cage wanted to buy one of it or one of the posters. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Nick Cage is actually a massive cinephile. Like, yes. um, I think people kind of, obviously he has this very like memeified reputation, but of all of the people in Hollywood working today. I think that he, within the industry, is like pretty well understood to be one of the biggest cinephiles and like just lovers of film and film history that's oh, yeah. out there. But yeah, Nick Cage is a massive cinephile and Dracula fan, so fun facts. Um, okay, Elliot, should we get into the plot Yes, Su such as it is, we can certainly get into the plot. <laughs> um, and one thing that we talked about this a little before, but um, one of the things that's fun about doing these Dracula films, because we are going to be doing several more Draculas. Like, we're pretty stuck There's in the... Yeah, it takes a while for cinema and media to kind of branch out from Dracula <laughs> and things that mm -hmm. kind of um, like ape or rip Dracula off. But you are a big fan of Dracula. You've read the book. You really love, you know, the, the whole like property. Um, and I mm -hmm. am like pretty much a lay person <laughs> when it comes to Dracula. Um, so it's interesting to hear your perspective on things especially like the story where all i have is what's in the film and you have the context for like the whole novel mm -hmm. yeah so yes i <laughs> yeah big big dracula property fan the book and all of that and i think having said that it's important to go into this movie with the awareness that this is really not an adaptation of the book it is an adaptation of the 1924 play. And so it's important to consider that because the movie, if you're looking at it as an adaptation of the book, it's, it's really not that faithful. And it kind of only keeps some characters, a few key events, but it changes a lot. So mm -hmm. um, one thing I was going to say is one thing that I find really interesting is that, you know, you're saying that it's definitely more of an adaptation of the play. And I also came across that in my research. But I think what's amusing about that is that they spent $40,000 on the rights to the yeah, novel. Yeah, because they saw what happened with Murnau. Yeah, They're like, yeah. that's not going to happen to us. But $40,000, no, right. yeah, $40,000 in 1931 money. Um, yes. They did not want... Bram 
Joker's wife coming for them. So, you know, yeah. yes, they bought up all the rights. Um, and, you know, initially they, they did kind of try to adapt it from the book more, but, you know, just the censors at the time were like, nope, nope, nope. And so they went to the play. Um, it was just more feasible, it sounds like. But it's interesting as we'll go into talking about the movie, how setting it, specifically the context of setting it within the present of the 1930s and looking at it as an adaptation changes a lot of the themes from the books and the characters. And we'll talk about that more. But yes, going in, just keep in mind, it's an adaptation of the play more than the book. So with that being said, Dracula and how it begins with its opening credits and the only bit of non-diegetic music in the whole film. Because did you notice that there wasn't any soundtrack? Yes, I did. We had a lot of um, kind of noise um noise in the noise more in the sense of like grain almost or there was a lot of white noise Mm -hmm. yes Um, yes definitely um a lot of just a lot of quiet kind of a lot of dead air yes some of it effective not so much yeah (laughs) but yeah so we get the opening credits with also i just love like kind of the um the black bat cut out in the background with the credits. I'm like, yes, Mm -hmm. we're in like kind of already cutesified vampire symbols. Like thanks Hollywood or um, no, the Halloween market has (laughs) infiltrated. The cottage industry is culture now. And so it's like, yay, we can have spooky, cute things like a black uh, cut out of a vampire bat. But yes, uh, Tchaikovsky Swan Lake is the only bit of non-diegetic Uh, music in the movie and it is played over the opening credits which was a common thing to do with uh, older films back then it was not typical to have credits at the end of movies Um, now that's kind of considered more of a artistic choice if you decide to have credits at the beginning of your film Mm -hmm. so we begin the movie straight away in Transylvania and Oh boy, is it jarring to see a bunch of people in 1930s clothes in a carriage in an, a movie about Dracula. Yes, it's <laughs> it's it's lots of like liberties are taken, I would say. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. As we'll get into, but yes, it's we begin right away in Transylvania, but first big change here, uh instead of having the main character of the solicitor going to see Dracula be Jonathan Harker, it is instead Renfield. Yes, we're cutting out the middleman a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can, um, yeah, they basically take Jonathan's storyline from the original text and give it to Renfield. So in a weird way, watching it, you're kind of like, is this just give Jonathan's storyline to Renfield or is it like a prequel to like, oh, look what happened to Renfield? Because in the book, Renfield did go to see Dracula before Jonathan and being overtaken by Dracula and becoming his familiar. familiar. So yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of interesting to see how this is, could be considered the first like Dracula from, but like what happened to Renfield sort of thing. And so, yes, we have Renfield traveling to see Dracula, and we get to kind of the local inn or tavern in Transylvania. And here we have, again, the Transylvanian civilians are kind of par for the course depicted as just superstitious locals, um, kind of similar to what we talked about in the Nosferatu adaptation, and they are warning Renfield not to go to Dracula. Mm-hmm. And uh, during this, while the innkeeper is warning him, it, it's kind of used as shorthand to provide exposition for how vampires work, because we got to have that in our vampire movies. Yes. How do they work? And he's like... The lore. The lore. He's like, he only comes out at night, and he has three yeah. wives, and all of that stuff. And <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know if you caught this, but is Renfield supposed to be British? I... I'm not sure, actually. That is an interesting, (laughs) that's an interesting question. (laughs) It's Um, like, we got to love that transatlantic accent. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think that realism was a bit less of a concern. It kind of in all sorts of ways at this time. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, like we talked about in 
past episodes, like we're still very much in the phase of things being about spectacle and, you know, audiences were, you know, like filmmakers, it's not, you know, this was, this is not the days of the honest trailer. Um, people, <laughs> people are not, you know, people are mm-hmm. not looking for, or cinema sins, you know, people are not looking mm-hmm. for mistakes like that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Renfield of dubious origin is warned not to go to Dracula's castle, which of course he does not listen to. And he does. And this is where we get um, a very, I personally thought, pretty cool shot. It was very atmospheric. It's like a nice tracking shot in of Dracula's kind of lair with the his coffin slowly opening and a hand emerging. I loved oh, this scene. shot. Yeah, I yes. thought it was... It was good. And again, I think here, the not having a soundtrack, I know I kind of talked about this when we were talking about Nosferatu in our last episode, but I said like the music was just so ongoing and consistent. Mm-hmm. I, I think it would have been more effective in some scenes had there been no music. So mm-hmm. I feel like this movie is the, the total inverse of that, where mm-hmm. there's no music. Sometimes maybe some music would have been good, but I think for shots like this, it really adds to the atmosphere. Yes. And... And just to give the, yeah, just to give the Mm -hmm. listeners like a bit more context on this shot, because I, I think that this is one of the strongest shots in the film Mm -hmm. is that like you're saying, we have this hand rising from the coffin, but the, the the hand performance (laughs) is, is incredible. Like there's like this, I believe it's one of his wives, but she's kind of undulating her fingers and like creating these clawed shapes. Mm -hmm. It's almost, um, there's sort of a, almost like a modern dance feeling to it. Yeah. Um, so, and I totally, I totally agree with you that the silence is vastly benefits the shot. Um, mm-hmm. And so you have this like lovely creeping kind of meandering hand reaching from, from this coffin. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we get our first shot of Dracula. I, I almost said no Spratu. <laughs> our, our first shot of Dracula coming towards the camera very slowly. Mm-hmm. And again, it's it's this movie's strongest uh, elements are, I think, in the silent moments and the stillness. Mm-hmm. And we get this, this great shot of uh, Bela Lugosi. And we see how he's going to be kind of lit throughout the film, which was very interesting, I thought, where his face is usually kind of cast in shadow, but there's always mm-hmm. just kind of a bar of light on his eyes, making them look really hypnotic. Yes. And um, it's very effective. And, yes. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was really, really good lighting. I agree. I mean, it, it's mm-hmm. another one of those things that if you think about it a little too much, you're like, where is that light <laughs> coming, from? coming from? Yeah, they're in a dungeon, um, but it is a technique that they use throughout the film is this really dramatic bar of light across his face. And you're mm-hmm. right. I think one of the reasons they use it so much is because it works. It looks really yes. good. Um, it just it just hits right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, he, he's striking eyes. Yes. He's got nice eyes. <laughs> and so <laughs> they they knew how to lit them well. And so then we cut back to Renfield and yay, I, you know, like I said, it's my weird thing where I'm just like, I like it when they include Dracula picking up the Jonathan character to go to the castle. And I forgot this movie did that as well, which kind of surprised me. So that is, again, something that is retained from the book. Uh, sadly, unlike the Nosferatu version, he does not have a cute Robin Hood hat on. Um, <laughs> his, his little feather, his little hat and his feather. Little feather. Um, no, his, uh, he's kind of more um, bound up and like a scarf and a hat. Um, and unfortunately, Renfield does not know you never get in with your Uber driver if they do not confirm your name. So he... <laughs> <laughs> Got to get that security code. Exactly, because he goes up to him. He's just like, you're taking me to Castle Dracula, you know nothing yeah it doesn't say anything and he's like sure (laughs) i'll ride with you yeah yeah so um then we come to castle dracula and again another great thing about this movie is just like all the beautiful kind of matte paintings Mm -hmm. in the movie which was common for the time yeah and we'll Um, talk more about i think mm -hmm. i think we can get more into like what a matte painting is um 
when we when we kind of sure. do our analysis. But yes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Gorgeous. And uh we get to Dracula's spooky gothic castle. Yay, a little bit of an upgrade from Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. Again, not that it wasn't cool that Nosferatu like used real castles. That was cool. But like I said, I like my big over the top spooky gothic castle and we get that here. And we get this really nice kind of long shot of Renfield inside the castle mm-hmm. um main entrance foyer area and it's just really good at showing the scale of it. And we get that um great big staircase and then Lugosi appears and we get the iconic good evening. <laughs> so this is our Dracula speaks. This is yes. the first on-screen Dracula to speak and it's it's iconic. An iconic voice and iconic line deliveries. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, Lugosi's really going to go munch, munch, no crumbs with this performance. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it's, I, yes, it is a great moment. It's a great way to introduce a character. And you're right that the, that the kind of grandiosity of the scale of the set for the mm-hmm. castle, I think works better in some ways than Nosferatu, especially because he's kind of awkward. <laughs> so, you know, he feel like I, I do think that there is a bit more um, command with this portrayal. Yeah, yeah like Dracula here, um, you know, in, in like in Nosferatu, we talked about it extensively about how his appearance was meant to um, evoke a certain kind of reaction, how it was not meant to be an appealing appearance, and it was supposed to be kind of off-putting. Um, in the text, from what I can remember, Dracula is supposed to be a lot more humanoid looking, but still kind of off-putting in some ways. He's like mm-hmm. got hairy palms and his like lips are naturally red. There's just like things that are slightly off about his appearance to mm-hmm. Jonathan that kind of clues the reader in that maybe this guy is not normal. But here we get kind of, I think, our first, you know, they can totally blend into society because they're just, you know, Bela Lugosi is just a handsome aristocrat yes. in terms of appearance. In Always movie. in a tux. <laughs> Always in a tux. Always a little overdressed sometimes, depending where he is. But yeah, so he, this is kind of our first completely normal like i i don't know if normal is the right term but you know very very most humanoid or first kind of really humanoid looking vampire on screen Mm -hmm. and so we come to the famous scene where dracula and renfield are having their discussion about um his purchase of the estate and uh this is my kind of takeaway, but I wonder if you caught this as well, but I was getting a lot of a queer and kind of homoerotic subtext from this scene. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think that, well, one of the things is that I would argue and agree with you that like, we are supposed to find these two men attractive. I think in a way that we're definitely not meant to find Count Orlock attractive. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is, there kind of is something that feels a bit queer about these two guys Mm -hmm. alone in this castle and that Dracula is like, come like rest, like, you know, come into this like (laughs) grand room. I've lit a fire for you. I've set the table for you. And Mm -hmm. I think one of the other things that really adds to the queer subtext for this, um, is that the bed is in the room as well. Yes. Like, and maybe this oh was gosh. a, maybe this was a financial constraint, but there's one point where Dracula walks off screen and then we cut to him and he's like, I hope you find the bed to your liking. And there's this enormous yes. four poster yes. bed. And, and it's just like a couple feet away from the table where they're mm-hmm. having dinner. Um, I know. I'm so glad you yeah, you noticed that. And you get this shot of Renfield going, thanks, it looks very inviting. And he does like, there's like this long pause where he's like, yes, like, kind of yeah. just, oh. they make um, eyes at each other a little bit. Th- they do make eyes. And even uh, before that moment, I, I noted when Dracula said, I trust you have kept your coming here a secret. Yes. And Ren- yeah, Renfield says, I followed your instructions 
thoroughly and it's very like, yeah. very obedient <laughs> <laughs> very obedient very yes no one knows but this we're clan fuck tonight <laughs> exactly this clandestine secret meeting mm-hmm, in this kind of mm-hmm. abandoned place with this like big cozy yeah. looking bed and <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly this huge fireplace yes the fireplace was ridiculous um <laughs> yeah so a lot of queer and homo erotic subtext which um, is common for not even Dracula movies, but just kind of vampire movies in general, which we mm-hmm. will get so much more into as we go along on this vampire viewing journey. Um, but yes, like I said, if you thought it was maybe kind of there in Nosferatu, it's it's definitely subtext here. And so I'm just kind of curious in the scene as we're going along, like what what were you getting from the performances of Lugosi and Renfield? What, mm-hmm. Were they striking you as very theatrical (laughs) well i think renfield is interesting because um he has a bit of a a case of kind of like gullible white Mm. person that we talked about last (laughs) time where it's like come on man just put a little bit of thought into this just like no self-preservation yeah because he seems a little uncomfortable with the carriage ride and Mm -hmm. with the introduction and everything but then he sees the table he sees the bed and for some reason (laughs) this kind of cuts down on his suspicions in a way um Mm -hmm. i think that i think performance wise i found Renfield to be much more believable as a person than Harker in Nosferatu um, because like that was a silent film so everything had to be so exaggerated and Harker just kind of seemed deranged from the start Um, but I think (laughs) Renfield in this he he does kind of seem like a a well-meaning chap Um, (laughs) yes yeah and then for Dracula I think I mean, I think that he's dramatic throughout the entire film in the sense that he has a very um, kind of stylized affect or it's he's definitely not trying to seem like a person or or he's he's not going for realism or naturalism. Exactly. And it's he kind of has these Uh very um, these very pronounced kind of ways of holding his body and moving his body. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm which I think also gets into some of what you've been saying about how this is much more based on the play than Mm -hmm. it is on the novel. Yes. The acting I, I found to be a lot of it very theatrical, which makes sense given its origins. And that I think a lot of these actors, a lot majority of their experience was in stage. Um, Even though like Lugosi had been working um, I think in smaller parts before, even then, but yes, so we get the scene and in Lugosi's performance, there's like kind of just like very deliberate pauses. He has a very kind of mm-hmm. slow cadence way of speaking. Um, and oh boy, does he, he has that evil smile down. I'm like, <laughs> Gary Oldman definitely took that evil smile. I feel like in Bram Stoker's Dracula from him. And yeah, so he kind of yeah has that evil evil smile down it's always very effective when it's just not even like when he's not even saying any lines and it's just his face and we get the scene where or not scene but we get the shot of renfield jonathan character cutting his finger this time not through like the worst bread cutting technique of all time (laughs) but through opening an envelope i think and we also get the very dramatic shot of the crucifix coming down in front of the cut and Dracula mm-hmm. flinging his arm in front of his face. And yeah, totally normal and average way know, to respond again, to yeah, a cross. We're, not that we're being theatrical in our movements here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so then Dracula leaves and this is when I think we get the shot of the three wives coming in. Yes, we do. And I well, I think one thing... Um, Just returning to the paper cut briefly, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. that was something that was in Nosferatu um, and they studied Nosferatu very, very closely in the making of Dracula. Mm -hmm. And like that moment is not in the play or in the book. And so I think it's um, this question of adaptation and ownership 
um, kind of comes up over and over again with these films um, because, you know, it's, it, I would maybe consider it in a bit poor taste now to watch a film and while making another film and kind of intentionally seek out ways mm-hmm. to reproduce um, you know, things that happened in that reference for you. I mean, that that feels pretty close to plagiarism, mm-hmm. or at least yeah. today, I think that would be considered in very poor form. Um, mm-hmm. And then you kind of get into questions of, you know, what's, um, you know, what's the difference between kind of plagiarizing something and referencing something? And what's the difference between kind of paying homage and not having your own creative spin on something um Mm -hmm. so i just think that that um is kind of an interesting fact about that about that shot and that moment um but you are correct that we then move to the wives who i felt we did not get enough of the wives no they were so cool and they those three actresses were not credited unbelievable (laughs) Unbelievable. You know what? We're fixing this. I'm looking it up now. Um, well, I think... Their names will be known. Yes, we we refuse to let these three women um, drift into obscurity and not be honored for their undeniable contributions. Their names are Dorothy Tree, Geraldine Dvorak, and Cornelia Thaw. Well, Dorothy, Geraldine, and Cornelia, thank you for your service. Yes. You were the best part of the movie, even though I don't know if we ever really even see their faces. We do. Not really. In... I think we, we, we might see. Get a yeah, I think we see them. I think we see them in wides mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have then no it lines. is. Yeah, they have no lines. Mm-hmm. They don't even get to like do any. Maybe this is a bit of a spoiler, but they don't even get to do any slaying or blood drinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dracula does off screen, granted, but <laughs> yeah, he because they come to approach Renfield, who has fainted from uh, I I don't know, he's low blood sugar, seeing a bat, but um, he <laughs> fainted and <laughs> low blood sugar. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, I, so I was watching this movie with my partner. When that happened, I, I, he just fainted, and my partner was going, wait, did Dracula spike his drink? Um, I thought a similar thing, actually, as well. I was like, yeah. did he poison him? Like, <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I thought um, Dracula was the bat that flew in and just kind of did his vampire hypnosis, but I could be wrong. Um so yes, Renfield faints for whatever reason, and the three wives approach to drink his blood, but then Dracula comes in, fog machine in tow, and yes. <laughs> um, silently forbids them from drinking. And then he drinks Renfield's blood, but this being the movie um, that it was made in the 1930s, we do not see it. We do not see any blood drinking in this movie. It is all implied. Which raises really interesting questions for our theme around, you know, the question of what is a vampire? Because Mm -hmm. when we made our um, mini episode on the House of the Devil, we both agreed that the baseline requirement for a vampire was the consumption of blood. Yes. And Dracula, for a couple different reasons... um, never really achieves blood drinking (laughs) status i mean it's like i don't know if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it doesn't make it sound like we it's all implied we have characters like van helsing saying the vampire drinks blood and that's how Mm -hmm. they sustain their their life force and uh you know i think there isn't really it's really not meant to be an ambiguous thing um, this is true. This is true. I but, just think that they... Yeah, um, yeah, unfortunately, we don't see it. Yes. They denied us our due as they did. Um, as vampire fans. Um, something I hope the Spanish language version maybe fixes. Maybe. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so now we cut to the... Uh, well, the Demeter, which is the ship that is taking Dracula and his um, 
coffins of native soil over to England. But for some reason in the movie, it's called the Vesta. I don't know why they changed it. It's not the Dem- uh, Demeter anymore. Yeah, I mean, maybe that was just, you know, who knows. But I, I did notice as well that, well, our move to the ship is very sudden. Um, yes, that this movie does that a lot. Yeah, just there there bits. are many, yeah, there are many scenes in which we are given no explanation for why, but we jump through a lot of time and space pretty mm-hmm. randomly. Yes, so we, yeah, we cut to the ship and here we get Dwight Fry getting his chance to shine he Mm -hmm. is in full master mode Um, (laughs) (laughs) he is he's the iconic renfield we know of now um he has become dracula's familiar and he again like this movie just knows how to shoot um shoot a face an unsettling disturbed face um, because we get that shot of him looking up uh from the uh, cabin area of the ship and mm-hmm. it's a it's a really great shot but another thing i also liked about this movie is that uh it, it kind of keeps the epistolary component of the book a bit because we get that um shot of the newspaper headline talking about how all the passengers on the ship were killed yes and how many yeah. were dead and it, it kind of keeps with the book's use of letters and newspapers and things mm-hmm. like that to kind of piece together the story. But also it could just be, it's a, it's a quick way of giving exposition. Um, yeah, I, you have a much higher tolerance for epistolary narratives than I do. <laughs> um, but I mean, it is, I, I do agree that it, it, um, it was helpful because they certainly weren't going to show us any of the action. Or, um, so I appreciated those things in the sense that it was like, okay, at least I know what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, because I think that this film would be um, a lot less enjoyable if you didn't know anything about the book or the play at all. I think I think that the film relies a lot on prior existing knowledge of the source material. Yes. Um, and mm-hmm. they're really, um, I think some of that laziness in terms of the directing um, is kind of like, oh, well, everyone knows the story of Dracula. Like, I don't have to craft a <laughs> coherent narrative. Um, yeah. And, yeah, which is a little unfortunate, you know, um, because they did have these, they had really talented people working on this film, especially in terms of the cinematography and the production design. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. it is, there's quite a lot left on the table in terms mm-hmm. of dramatic poten- potential. Yes, a lot of unrealized potential. Um, and so I I found the shot of Dracula walking in the streets of London uh, so interesting uh, in terms of the costuming, he is dressed kind of to the nines and has his tuxedo and tails and cape and top hat. He's giving like, like he's serving very Jack Ripper vibes. Oh, <laughs> um, fascinating. Which, yeah, I mean, that is another kind of figure that has become more um, uh, symbolized or iconic within pop culture, especially with the appearance of the top hat and the cape. So mm-hmm. I thought he was kind of serving. And it was also interesting how he he does clearly look a little bit out of place amidst the 1930s uh, costume, um, fashion that everyone else is wearing, which makes sense you know, mm-hmm. for his character. Um, so, yes. And then we cut to the opera house and we well actually no before we go to the opera house, we see um, a flower girl offering him a flower. And again, we get that great just close up of his face and eyes and then mm-hmm. he grabs the the girl and we hear a scream off screen but no <laughs> blood drinking <laughs> just if only we had kept a tally of how many incredibly mm-hmm. important events happen off screen off screen <laughs> yeah exactly so then we get to the opera house where um we are introduced to Mina, Lucy, Jonathan Harker, and in this adaptation, Jack Seward is not one of Lucy's suitors, but is Mina's father, and he is still a doctor who runs um, a mental uh, institute, and uh, Dracula, I, I wonder if this is the first movie, I think, that 
shows Dracula using hypnotism. I don't think that was something he could do in the book. This was uh, this was actually something I also included in my notes and and you know kind of one of the aspects of the conversation around lore mm-hmm. but I also wrote down that I believe that this is the first instance mm-hmm. of a vampire using a glamour or putting mm-hmm. someone in a trance mm-hmm. or hypnotizing them um I think that in Nosferatu Count Orlock certainly seems able to like it kind of influence people um and he has this relationship with Renfield but I would agree with you that this is the first time that we see Dracula kind of um put the moves on <laughs> on just you know just yeah. anyone you know he, it, this does seem to be um one of his special mm-hmm. abilities in addition to turning into a bat and later in the film it's implied that he turns into a wolf as well yes yes which he can do in the book um he can turn into a bat, he can turn into a wolf, he can turn into fog, all of which we have seen in different adaptations, but still not my favorite, where it says he can slip through keyholes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that as fog he can do that, or? No, I think that's actually like a separate An thing entirely <laughs> separate ability? <laughs> like, it's something like he's so tiny, or like he just, I don't know. He can he's just... so tiny? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I really love this. It's in some ways that kind of makes him less scary, even though the ability to pass through a keyhole is quite threatening. Um, It is, but also a, I guess, (laughs) a skill that no longer um, really serves to cause any worry now that we, as a, our current society doesn't really have keyholes on doors anymore. Um, Fair, fair. Yeah. But so yes, Dracula uh, hypnotizes um, one of the um, female ushers working there and uh, is allowed into the box with the other characters. And I remember my partner saying this when we were watching it, because if this gives an indication of just kind of how kind of stagey and choreographed the movements are, where Dracula mm-hmm. just comes up as Jack, uh, Dr. Seward is leaving the box and like Dracula says hello or good evening or whatever, Dr. Seward immediately pivots and addresses him. And my partner said it was like a Skyrim character, like coming up to <laughs> another and pressing A and like it starts talking. There's like no, there's no naturalism in terms of like, uh-huh. wait, whoa, you talking to me? Like kind of. Um, the NPC which is has just, been engaged. <laughs> which is kind of funny. Again, we we love the, the staginess. Um, and also, so, okay, I love Lucy in this version. She is serving in this, her flapper haircut and yes. like her yeah, choker and everything. Yeah. She, she's uh, definitely given the goth girl kind of who's into Dracula and his weird vibes in this movie, which is great. And also, you know, because she has flapper hair that she will be the sexually uninhibited bad girl. So she's kind of giving um, in the scene immediately after the I think it's immediately mm-hmm. after the kind of theater scene. We have a bit of a moment like um, the idol where, <laughs> oh, where, she, where she's like, oh, I like I like him. And, yeah, and Mina is no. like, you, that's weird. And it, yeah, it was a bit but, reminiscent of Lily Rose Depp being like, like um, yeah, I kind of I like, kind of like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I like oh. his rapey vibes. And it's like, oh, hmm, God. Yeah, no. yeah, women don't really feel that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, oh, Lucy, poor Lucy. Uh, yeah, so she's. Yeah, love the flapper hair, love the look, and um, I like that she quotes, you know, uh, old poetry with Dracula about death and dying, and like, there's, like, Jonathan and Mina are so, like, oh my, Lucy, <laughs> lovely sentiment, and it's just, yeah, they're cl- literally cl- clural pe- or pearl clutching. Yeah, and um, Lucy's like, let's talk about death and do yeah. it. <laughs> Dracula's just like, I like this girl. Um, yeah. So, we, yeah, we the scene afterwards, we uh, cut to Mina and Lucy in the room. And like you said, Lucy's, you know, like, I, oh, I like him. I like his weird, <laughs> weird vibes and dark <laughs> vibes. And Mina's just, I love Mina so much. She's like, oh, he's all right, I suppose. Just give me someone a little more normal. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and it's like, you know what? Fair yes. enough. You know, we have our different our different speeds of different <laughs> we, strokes we for different folks. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then we get this is where I made the Jack the Ripper connection where Lucy is up in her window and, you know, getting changed or ready for bed. And she opens mm-hmm. the window up and we see Dracula literally in coat and top hat stalking the cobbled London streets at night in fog. And he walks by the house and we get that um, that really good shot of Lucy by the window and Dracula looking up. So there's a kind of more of this emphasis on this uh this invasion of kind of like a domestic space or the domestic sphere because it's a very domestic movie a lot Mm -hmm. of the scenes take place in living rooms and bedrooms um yes and then we um yes she's in bed and we get our great um (laughs) a big old cartoon bat flapping its wings in front of the window and it's so yes very yeah, I think um, one of the things that we can talk about it is like the, the role that animals play just kind mm-hmm. of as part of the mise-en-scene and just mm-hmm. um, there are so many kind of animals that appear over the course of this film. Um, yes. You know, we, we get lots of bats, but, you know, we also get we get possums, armadillos, spiders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um and like there, it's not that there wasn't an animal component in Nosferatu. Uh, I think that film took a more documentarian approach to animals. Mm-hmm. So we get the scene of Dracula entering Lucy's bedroom and slowly approaching before again cut because we can't show any blood drinking. And then we see a hospital where they're examining Lucy's body, and wow. Her death was really quick. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I did um, like that it was a theater. It was like an operating theater, and we're kind of high up, so we see all the people yes. watching. Yes. Um, so, yes, Lucy has died, maybe, um, from Dracula. And then we our next scene is in Dr. Seward's uh, sanitarium, and we get, again, a really nice long tracking shot through the grounds and then up into Renfield's window where he's asking for um, insects to drink the blood out of. And Dwight Fry is just so good and, you know, just really great in this part, I think, in this scene. Mm-hmm. And yes. so now that Lucy has been turned by Dracula, which we will see later. Um, his attention, Dracula's attention turns to Mina and we realize that, uh, he has been drinking Mina's blood. So now we kind of get the part of the film where Dr. Van Helsing is introduced as vampire expert. And, uh, we get a lot of men convening and talking about what to do with Mina right there. Yes, (laughs) yes. (laughs) She is she's sent to her room like a child and by her father, no less. So Yes, yeah, with a wreath very, of Wolfsbane to protect the wreath her. Of Wolfsbane. Um yes, yeah, so a very kind of yeah, a very patronizing attitude to give her and also oh, I feel kinda of bad for the, Jonathan's actor. He really is given nothing in this movie. Um Yeah, he do. he has nothing to do except be like don't leave me, Mina. <laughs> Mina, darling, you're going to get well. You're going to live. And a lot of that. And mm-hmm. so uh, we, yes, we get uh, the Scooby gang convening and talking about, uh, <laughs> you know, vampires. With, like we get just, you know, the, the Dr. Van Helsing role serves in a lot mm-hmm. of these movies to be like, no, this is like what the vampire does. And like, this yes. is how we will destroy yeah. him. And we get a what I thought actually to be one of the strongest scenes in the movie, which is the confrontation between Van Helsing and Dracula. And I felt like here the actors were really both on their game. Um, Lugosi's performance in this scene seems slightly less theatrical, mm-hmm. and um, there's there's not as much stilted pauses and things like that. I feel like it's mm-hmm. it's yeah. it's a solid scene, and we also get the shot of him. Well, the shot of him not being in the reflection of the cigarette case mirror. Uh-huh. So I think that's the first time we see vampires in an on-screen um, film 
not having a reflection. Yes. So that, that yeah. kind of clues Van Helsing into what, what what's up mm-hmm. with this guy. And so they have their little confrontation. Uh, Dracula tries to use his Jedi mind powers and it doesn't work <laughs> on Van Helsing. Yeah, I think that you're right that this sequence is one of the strongest in the film because acting wise, I believed that Van Helsing was resisting the psychic mm-hmm. influence of Dracula mm-hmm. in that moment. So mm-hmm. I think you're right that their chemistry was good. Uh, I believed the circumstances. I saw Van Helsing kind of struggling to resist. Um, yeah. So that was that was a high point of the film. Yeah, definitely. And so later we on, we see that um, Lucy was turned into a vampire. Again, like we get one shot of vampire Lucy, I think. Uh, and, you know, I think she is killed off screen. But at this point... Mina has become more and more, um, fallen more and more under Dracula's influence. Mm-hmm. And I think he, he utilizes Renfield here to help take Mina or kidnap Mina. And so the final kind of scene of the movie is Dracula with Mina at the Abbey. And this is where Renfield is honestly kind of brutally killed. Um, but again, screen, again, it's, or, well, no, it's, screen, but, you know. it's almost on screen. Almost but, on screen. Okay, really quick, though. Yeah. Um, I think that the scene of the two groundskeepers is so funny where they're mm-hmm. like, um, just because you had said that we go from, you know, Mina and then the last sequence, we do have one beautiful, incredible moment with two of the groundskeepers. And there's this guy and he's like, I think they're all crazy, except you. And even you, I think, are crazy sometimes. <laughs> um, that was so great. Yeah. Yes. That was a really great moment. And also, I forgot to mention again, uh, Dwight Fry really giving, I think, the best performance in the movie where he's talking with the men and he's breaking down. And he's saying, God will not damn a lunatic soul. It's kind of heartbreaking. Um, yeah. He's he's really far gone at this point, and uh, that yeah that shot of him slowly crawling to the maid that had fainted to drink her blood oh, I thought was very good. I love that. I thought that, that was, was so like, creepy oh, was and so good. Yes, that was great. Um, and then and then when we in terms of his kind of tormented, you know, the torment that he feels mm-hmm. when we see when we see his final moments, you know, he begs Dracula for his life in a way that it kind of returns to our a little bit of our kind of kinkiness where he says uh yeah. uh punish me torture mm-hmm. me mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. I'll be your slave just don't kill me um yeah. I can't die with all these lives on my yeah. all these all this blood on my hands um yeah. like what a yeah what a tragic character um yes know, but we do very... yeah Mm-hmm. Oh, but well, we just don't actually see him die is kind yes. of what we were talking about before <laughs> yeah, is yeah. that we kind of the exact moment of Dracula killing Renfield, we cut away to Van Helsing and co arriving to the castle. And right. it's like maybe at most a second. And then we cut back and Renfield's body is tumbling down the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and even for the time, just his his screams, that had to be censored initially. Mm-hmm. It was um, considered too graphic. And so Van Helsing and Jonathan, they go to the Abbey to find Mina and Dracula. And they, because the sun is rising, Dracula and his wives are in their coffin and they can't find Mina. But, you know, mm-hmm. Van Helsing's like, mm, go find her. I'm going to go kill him. And uh, <laughs> I'll do the dirty uh, work. <laughs> I'll do the dirty <laughs> I'll do the dirty work. And so he finds Dracula in his coffin and we see Mina standing somewhere very still and silent. And Mm -hmm. Van Helsing begins to kill Dracula, of course, off screen. And um, I I thought this kind of scene was very effective with, again, just the silence of it and Mina just standing there. And as they're killing Dracula, it's like she's like has like she's trying to... I don't know, just gain control of her body again. Or mm-hmm. and then you just hear her shout out for Jonathan. And yeah, so Dracula's killed off screen and Jonathan finds Amina and she is saved. They go up the staircase and end movie. Yes, I think that 
short of the ending of The Sopranos. This <laughs> is this is one of the most abrupt film endings I have yes, ever seen. That is what my partner said. He could not believe how abrupt it was. And I had seen the movie before, so I knew it was coming. But yeah. It's and, it's miraculous that there that there's no explanation. Like it's just over. <laughs> it's like just... listen, I think this was just kind of part of the movies at the time. It's just okay. The monster has been killed, and the breeding pair can you know go forth. And... <laughs> the breeding pair. Oh yes, my god! I did not coin that. That is Lindsay Ellis who said that, but it's great, and I'm using it. <laughs> and no, that's it is so true. It's amazing. You're right. They totally are the breeding pair. Um. <laughs> yeah, and so it's just I, I guess audience expectations are what they needed for a satisfying conclusion were maybe more simple than. Well, speaking of a satisfying conclusion, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about this film is that it was a smash hit. Yes, it completely like it. Universal Studios was struggling um, as a studio. This film revitalized the studio. It's what triggered the Universal Studios Monsters kind of sub label mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and that push of films from the 30s to the 50s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bride of Frankenstein, all of the you, you know, all of those classics. So as flawed as the film may be now um at the time audiences loved it i think i saw yeah. i think i saw a quote from someone i can't remember who that was like the the most influential bad movie of all time or something oh like i that. love that yeah because okay i think we can say it it's not a good movie <laughs> <laughs> yes i think you liked it a bit more than i did i did, i thought it was bad mm -hmm. i did i yeah. thought this was not a yes. good film Yes, there's stuff I I do like in it. There's parts of it that I think are good, and there's a lot, just a, like a lot of unrealized potential. I think. Yeah, no, Bela ba Lugosi clearly cared about the part and took it very seriously, and he gives an iconic performance. His choices are really interesting, and it's like just a very striking role that he, um, you, you know, he went all the way with it, and I respect that. But um, w when it comes to other monster movies with actors like um. Boris Karloff, I think they're just stronger act. He's a stronger actor. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why movies like Frankenstein or The Mummy, I th find more effective. Um, but interesting enough that Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff were in a movie together. I think it was called Black Cat. And if we're talking about like off screen violence, this is right before the Hays Code like really goes into full effect. And I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that movie ends with one of them flaying the other alive oh my god <laughs> and it's like you only see it in shadow that's um, yeah that's even in shadow a live mm -hmm. flaying is pretty pretty hardcore that's, i don't listen, think we even get that in game of thrones um, yeah no pre pre haze code horror films were a trip but yeah so um yeah i <sighs> Yeah, it's. I was a little disappointed. It was not. I wanted it to be more than it was. It had been a while since I had seen it, but yes, I agree. It's not a very mm -hmm. good movie, but there's some good stuff in it. Yeah, and just to just to give some context in case anyone listening doesn't know what the Hayes Code was, um, the Hayes Code um, was a sort of. Um, it was a guide of things that were and weren't allowed in films, um, kind of put out by the motion picture um producers and distributors of america and well the mpa the motion picture association and um will hayes is the name of the president um and he kind of spearheaded this i think it's fair to say that this was a pretty puritanical and aggressive set of rules that were applied um mm -hmm. you know this I would consider this very much to be a form of censorship. You know, there were all mm -hmm. sorts of things that were not allowed. Um, and, you know, like I, pregnancy, you couldn't talk about, like there were all sorts of rules about violence, but also things that had to do with like sexuality mm -hmm. and um, really, really, really um, kind of repressive standards. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think, I think it's interesting that you bring up the Hayes Code because censorship has presented itself as a theme 
even just in these first three episodes that we've done. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I, I suspect that that will be something that persists throughout the course of this show is that censorship is going to be something that comes up a lot and affects the films and TV shows that, that we talk about. Um, but yeah, it is, I, I do know that, that some things were cut from the film. Like you mentioned the screams, Renfield screams as he dies, those mm -hmm. were removed, removed from the film. And, um, as was a kind of closing epilogue speech. Yes. Given by Edward Van Sloan, who played Van Helsing. They did something similar for the beginning of Frankenstein, which that is still retained um, in the uh, film today. But yes, the that scene for Dracula has been lost by all accounts. Mm -hmm. And also Dracula's kind of dying or death moans when he's being staked were also originally edited. Mm -hmm. So, And there's also, uh, this is not exactly an example of censorship, but this sound technology was so new at this point that a silent version of this film was released so that theaters that hadn't mm -hmm. been kitted yes. out with sound capabilities could still show the film. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so that's, that's just a fun thing to know just because yeah. of how quickly technology changes. Uh, you know, our last episode, Nosferatu, that film was from... 22 yeah 22 yeah. so this is nine years only nine years later and you know we have films being released in sound and that that has happened so quickly that not even the theater showing them have been mm -hmm. able to fully catch up um yeah interesting um okay so do we have any other thoughts we want to give on the movie yeah i think um i think we we talked a bit about some of the production stuff but for me the highest points of this film had to do with the aesthetic aspects mm -hmm. um, and some of those production techniques. Uh, so we had mentioned earlier that this film used uh, matte paintings. Mm -hmm. And so basically a matte painting is you um, a technique where you take a pane of glass and you paint a background onto it and then you mask out portions of the painting that the kind of live action motion is going to be put in. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically the, the way that this was primarily utilized in, um, in this film is in the opening scene where the carriage is traveling through the mountains, the mountains were painted on a glass sheet and then a gap was left on the road where the carriage would pass through. And so the director would film a, a shot of the glass painting and then they would also have shot the carriage. And then what they would do is they would project the shot of the carriage driving onto the back of the glass painting. So from the mm -hmm. front, it appears as one cohesive shot. And so this at the time was, you know, pretty revolutionary. This is a technique that was um, used a lot in early Disney films. Bambi utilized glass, um, glass oh, paintings and matte paintings. Yeah, and some of the, like, for example, Bambi, some of those really beautiful textured shots of the forest, that was oh. created, yeah, that was created through a technique of stacking matte paintings to create depth. So you would shoot down through a stack of mats that each had different aspects of the forest painted on it to create that that really lovely mm -hmm. kind of feeling of depth. Um, so, you know, knowing that knowing that that technique was used in the film, I think is really interesting. And then another kind of significant thing about the film that I wanted to touch on was just the cinematographer um, Frond, who you mentioned, who mm -hmm. also worked on Metropolis and I Love mm -hmm. Lucy. And he was especially famous for his innovations in camera movement specifically because up to this point cameras were pretty static they stayed on the tripod and that was pretty much it you know we were very limited mm -hmm. in you know where we put the camera and what we did with the camera when it was rolling and like we've talked about a lot and like you've talked about a lot this film feels very much like a play in the sense that we have a room where people come in they talk about things that have happened off stage and then you're kind of watching from one position and then people leave. 
So another interesting thing about the production of this film was that the cinematographer Frund was um, known for his unchained camera technique. He was not the first person to use this technique, but he is considered to be the pioneer of this technique. And so basically what that means is that the camera is not on the tripod exclusively. Um, and so this kind of allowed for things like um, pans, tilts, crane shots, tracking shots. This predates the invention of the dolly. So we weren't quite at that level of having the camera on a track and then that it would kind of be almost on like a little um, like a little cart, uh, but this was the, the beginning of camera techniques that were kind of moving past static shots. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, sorry. Uh, I was saying that's really interesting. And so you, did you, would you say you liked the cinematography of the movie? It's it's interesting that you ask that because this guy was famous for for this technique and for that style of cinematography, but I don't think that this film really utilized those skills or that this film is a very strong example of that because many of the shots in the film and many of the scenes in the film are kind of shown through fairly standard mediums and close-ups and 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 wides we have some wides as well yeah and they're also static so i was kind of surprised when you said he pioneered making a camera not static i was like really where was that in the movie because in my brain i thought the first time we see dracula there's this really great crane shot up the stairs mm -hmm. to him that's not the case so i think what my brain is thinking of is maybe the spanish version which as we have ad uh, addressed before is considered by some to be at least a more technically superior film yes it's also possible that as we've talked about this was a really disorganized production yes. and there was um you know that the cinematographer kind of ended up having to take over a lot of the directing duties and earlier in the show we mentioned that like there wasn't anything like a shot list and i don't know if shot lists existed back then but today a shot list is very much what it sounds like it's a list of all of the shots that are going to be filmed over the course of the day and you know, they're all planned out and in the order that they're going to be shot in. And those kinds of things are really, really important because a shot takes a long time to set up. Lights take a long time to set up. You have to, and the blocking as well, if you're doing blocking, that can take a while. And so it's entirely possible that Friend would have wanted to use those techniques, but that there just wasn't time and support to accomplish those more complicated um, and technically difficult shots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, yeah, I wonder who the cinematographer was for the Spanish language version. I guess we can talk more about that in our next episode. But yeah, that's unfortunate uh, that he, Freud was most likely constrained in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and also that he really wasn't recognized for taking over a lot of the directing duties for the movie. Because, um, yeah. And I think Todd Browning was supposed to be a, like a pretty well-organized or uh, at least a professional director. So I don't know what happened here. He didn't mm -hmm. like the movie. Well, I don't know what was going on. But yes. I, I well, also saw that he was t generally a pretty meticulous director so I, I found the yeah. same thing in my research as you did so I think maybe you can see that more in his other work if it's for a project he cares more about like say something like Freaks um, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably his most famous film so yeah um, not it's like I don't know what like a modern equivalent would be it's like having Roger Deakins being your cinematographer and being like, mm, I just want to use like really 
normal lighting and medium <laughs> close-ups and all the shots. Long shots and medium close-ups. Keep that camera locked down. So Yeah. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> it, yeah, it it does feel like another example of the wasted potential of this yes. project and that that was um I think kind of top to bottom there was a lot of wasted potential with this film which is sad you know like I'm never rooting against a film I'm never starting a film being like man I hope this sucks (laughs) um you know I always want it's really difficult to make movies you know every film that's completed is a miracle and so it is yeah so yeah it's just sad (laughs) more than anything yeah and I agree a lot of a lot of wasted potential. Um, you know, Bela Lugosi, I think, is one of certainly the most memorable part of the movie, just for his choices as an actor and mm-hmm. how he's considered so iconic. And also just kind of what the movie introduced about Dracula in the story and to kind of the cultural pantheon. Um, mm-hmm. Even though getting into um, some, some themes here, um, it's very strange to watch... Um, kind of a Dracula adaptation where it takes place in the time in which the movie is made, especially watching this, where it is a movie clearly set in the early 1930s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have Dracula, who's still kind of supposed to represent this fear of the other, um, this um, old world supernatural evil entity that should be clashing with modernity i guess but um Mm -hmm. i just think that works a lot more in the original book when it's the late 1800s and you've kind of had the first few decades of industrialization and um all of that going on and kind of the the dichotomy between the the new world and the old world i feel like is more pronounced in the original book Mm -hmm. and that theme is stronger here it's like the early 1930s and van helsing's like i don't know he's I, I don't know. It's just like, we don't believe in the old <laughs> spirit of Dracula anymore or whatever. Or like, it's like our science has made us forget that. And it's, <laughs> I don't know. It just, it's 1930s is a kind of interesting time period to still be working on those themes. Um, Cause we're kind of past yeah. all that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I feel like this film is lacking in subtext um, in for, yeah. the, for the most part. I mean, there's some like homoeroticism and some queer subtext and, um, you know, it's not like it's totally devoid of meaning. But, you know, when we compare this to Nosferatu, that mm-hmm. film was absolutely like stuffed to bursting with all sorts of subtext around nationality and around and around community and the threat of the other and just so many things and and even as we talked about um some of the subtext and historical context around anti-semitism and you know xenophobia and all sorts of things and obviously those are really negative aspects of subtext Mm -hmm. and really negative connotations. Um, But I think that this 1931 film, this 1931 Dracula is um, for the most part, doesn't really have as much going on beneath the surface. Oh no, no, definitely not. Um, Yeah. I agree with everything you said compared to Nosferatu. It is quite uh, thematically void, I would say. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's why people still put on the play years later. It's just like it's an easy enough kind of um, I don't know if easy is the right term, but it's it's a play that I don't know. Any audience could go in at any time and kind of just get it and Mm -hmm. be like, okay. Um, you don't necessarily need, I think, a specific cultural context going into it uh, with the play. But uh, yeah, there's some there's some thematic subtext, like you said, especially with the homoeroticism. I think also this is kind this is the first movie that in terms of at least visuals and imagery alone kind of you know puts in the the general consciousness or subconscious of viewers the idea of 
Dracula being kind of this predatory creature that specifically preys on women. In this case, these women are always asleep. Um, Mm -hmm. Which is, I was just kind of realized, is an interesting contrast to a movie that was made 10 years before it in 1922, Mm -hmm. where the uh, main female character uh, does, like, have more agency and willingly, kind of, as willingly as you can, uh, offers her blood to um, Count Orlock. And here in this case, uh, we kind of get more, I think, of the connotation of Dracula and vampirism um, being uh, an allegory for something like S.A., maybe, Um, and kind of like that invasion of the domestic space with this guy, like, slowly approaching these Mm -hmm. sleeping women and, like, all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, that idea that he kind of preys on women in their sleep definitely carries connotations of sexual violence and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, and just, and yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that when we look at the whole kind of history of vampire media, my guess is that this idea of preying on someone when they're sleeping really falls to the wayside, but that the kind of connection to an allegory for uh, sexual assault or rape or, you know, other Mm -hmm. forms of sexual Mm -hmm. violence, like I think that that relationship remains. But when I think of the most contemporary examples of vampire media, it is quite rare, I believe, that we see a vampire intentionally feeding on someone who's asleep. Um, I think that that's yes. a lot yeah. less, yeah, a lot less common, which makes sense. It's, it's less, um, it's less exciting. And as, <laughs> yeah. as you're saying, well, the... <laughs> in terms of action and in terms of like <laughs> right. dr- drama, yeah, drama yeah. And, and kind of like, uh, kind of tension and things like that. Uh, and mm, I sure. think it's also, as you said, Mina, um, Ellen Mina in um, Nosferatu, like she has more agency because she's conscious when this is happening. So Mm -hmm. I think you're also right that one of the other benefits of kind of stepping away from that trope is that characters can have more agency within the story. And that's generally better for it's like it's better storytelling if your characters have agency and can participate in the action rather than just, you know, mm-hmm. lying there. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And yeah, I hadn't really thought about what you said, which is that we really don't see that anymore just because from a technical or blocking standpoint, it's not that, I guess, visually engaging. Um, I think we're going to see a little bit more um, of people being asleep as vampires drink from them as we go on. But yeah, I don't think that's something that's still really being done in vampire media anymore if anything i think there's definitely been a big big shift in vampire media in the past few decades of making that moment like more consensual in terms of like the person (laughs) being awake it also being you know framed in a much different way as not a predatory thing but an intimate or a sharing kind of activity uh-huh. Or um, or or still as an attack, you know, I think still as an attack, but the yeah. person is typically awake. Yeah, I think another aspect of that might be just realism. Uh, as we've talked about, realism was a much less of a concern in these early days of cinema. And I think that now this stretching the disbelief to the to the idea that someone could remain asleep through a stranger biting their throat and feeding on them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think we just kind of believe that a little less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, I think that's kind of... I'm trying to think if there's any other really big themes. I don't... mm. Oh, we didn't talk about... I mean, this isn't so much a theme as it is a visual (laughs) motif, but I, we didn't talk, we talked a little about this a little. I thought the, the animals were great. I think, mm-hmm. yeah, I think my favorite moment in the film, well, I, my two favorite moments in the film is that first, that shot of the wife's hand creeping out of the coffin. Oh, yeah. um, so good. And then, oh my God. And I just remembered immediately after that shot, there's a shot of 
a spider crawling out of its own mini coffin, I believe. Oh, unless yeah. I don't think it was a spider, but it was a different kind of bug. But I, yeah, I remember the shot. Yes, and it's like got its own little baby coffin. But I think one of my other favorite moments of the film is when Renfield looks out of the carriage window and the carriage is being guided by a bat. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, that big old bat. Yeah, and so the idea that... that. Yeah, it's the idea that the horses would better follow a bat than, like, a human <laughs> man holding the reins is really, really amusing. And I oh. thought that that was incredible and hilarious, that he just looks out the window and it's like, oh, I guess the carriage driver is a bat now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, Runfield and or Jonathan character, he just... <laughs> keep ignoring those red flags but he's very trusting he really believes he the is. best in people <laughs> i know like i said i felt bad for this uh, kind of iteration of that character uh yeah i think dwight fry along with bela lugosi definitely the best part of this movie C- considering that we both thought that this film was not very good i think we had mm-hmm. a great discussion of it i think i think we drew out um some things that were perhaps more interesting than the movie yes. itself. Please, Spanish version, address those things and make it better. Um, yes, I am. I have strong hopes for the Spanish version. I'm hoping to see mm-hmm. some actual blood drinking on camera. I am hopeful as well. So I'm excited because it's one I haven't seen, but I've heard about and have wanted to see for a while. Um, yes. All right. So I guess just to wrap things up, uh, thank you for listening to another episode of This Podcast Sucks. And you can catch our next episode on the Spanish language version of 19 of 19. Wait, ugh, fuck. OK, do you actually do you want to say that part? And I can say thank you for listening. Yeah. Where are you reading? from? I wasn't reading from anywhere. Oh, OK, um... but maybe I should. I'll pause the All right, we are unpaused. All right, and so with that, thank you for listening to another episode of This Podcast Sucks. Find us where you get your podcasts, follow us on social media, and give us a like. We'd love to hear from you guys, and remember, stay bloodthirsty. Catch our next episode on George Melford's Dracula.